Is it going? Okay. Okay. How many people there? Okay. So there's quite a few. Okay. All right. So let me let me go through the kind of the review slides and see if we can do that. Okay. Does anybody see PowerPoint slides there? Yes. Okay. There's one. One yes. You can if if you don't want to say anything, you can just shift. You know, give me a thumbs up or something like that. So I'll say the same things each time. Thank you, Ariel. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, it, the, it's all repetition, you know, to, to work this out, repetition, active methods, those are all important. Um, and do things in short sections. Don't try and spend four hours at a crack. 15 minute sections are probably the best. Um, you know, I'll ask you about kind of the overview stuff. So, so, um, you know, the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system uh, versus somatic nervous system. I'll, I'll, I'll have questions on all that. General functions, sensory motor integration. Those are all kind of, um, I think they're kind of easy things, but you know, you have to kind of get them in order. Um, I'll ask about cranial nerves, spinal nerves, um, those, those kind of general divisions. And so those are, are good thing places to start as an overview. Um, and so we'll go there. Um, again, with neurons, uh, a lot of the first chapter, chapter 12, is basically dealing with how the cells work. So nerve, the nervous system contains neurons. Neurons are big, long-lived cells. And they all have a central cell body with a nucleus. Uh, they have receptive surface dendrites, and then usually one axon that transmit things away. Um, and so all neurons can receive and send messages. All neurons have uh, uh, these cell potentials. They, almost all neurons release neurotransmitters, okay? So then the membrane potential, okay? This is the neuron cell membrane, okay? That cell membrane, at, when the neuron isn't active, the cell membrane has a charge. It's more negative inside than it is outside. So it has this resting potential, okay? That's um, due to the sodium and potassium. Sodium ions are moved out of the cell, potassium ions are moved in, and more sodium is moved out than potassium is moved in, so the cell is charged and uh, it has these, these chemical gradients. Then when the cell goes through an action potential, ion channels open, first sodium channels open, and that means the cell becomes less negative. So you see that once the cell goes past a threshold, ion channels open and the cell becomes briefly positive. Those sodium channels will close, then potassium channels open and potassium will diffuse out and the cell, whoops, will become, the cell will become negative again, and it'll, it'll do this undershoot, okay? Uh, the cell has to reach a threshold before it can do this, this action potential. So there's a threshold, and this change in charge is due to gated ion channels, okay? All right, so now let's go here. So, uh, neurons, most neurons are gonna, the vast majority of neurons signal other neurons at a synapse, which is where an axon of one neuron meets the uh, dendrite of another neuron, or it could be like a muscle cell. And at this, this junction of the synapse, there are stored neurotransmitters. And when an action potential re reaches this, this bulb at the end, uh, there are calcium channels open and that causes the vesicles to move and the neurotransmitters are released into this little gap and they diffuse across and they're going to bind to receptors. Okay? And so then the receptors will stimulate or inhibit the other cell. Okay, So that, that's kind of the basic how the cells work. There's other types of cells, but the neurons are the only ones that send and receive messages. Okay, the other cells kind of assist the neurons. Okay, then the basic anatomy stuff of the nervous system, you have the brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord's not too hard. 
Um, it's in the vertebral foramen, and so it, it extends from the brain down to uh, about the lumbar region, and then it gives off two spinal nerves between each two vertebrae, okay? Uh, it has thicker regions where it gives off lots of nerves in the cervical region and in the lumbar region. Um, there, the, um, there is, uh, since it ends in like the, the first couple lumbar, there are nerves that continue down in the vertebral canal and are going to exit lower down. This is the cauda equina. And then there's just a, a the phylum turni is just a, a piece of connective tissue that holds it in place. Okay, this is the cross-sectional view. This area out here is the white matter. Or, yeah, the, that's the white matter. Those are myelinated nerve tracts. There's ascending and descending tracts. Um, the ascending tracts are mostly in the dorsal region, and the descending ones are ventral and lateral uh, for the most part. The gray area in the center, this is unmyelinated regions, so you have nerve, nerve cell bodies and lots of synapses there. This is uh, kind of a reflex center and, and a little bit of integration. And so our reflexes are often centered in those. Okay, and then these two things coming out, these are the nerve roots and then that's the spinal nerve. Um, let's see. Okay, so I mentioned, I mentioned these things as a reflex. And so reflex, lots of reflex activity happens in this gray matter. And so incoming sensory neurons bring something in and then they can activate a motor neuron or an interneuron that will go back to to make the muscles. Reflexes are allow us to quickly respond to to some sort of stimuli and so pain receptors, uh, tension receptors for muscles, these all need quick responses and so um, there'll be something that goes to the brain but uh, the, the reaction is already happening in the muscle. And so just allows it to go nice and fast. And the brain will become aware of it a little later. Okay, so then the other big part of the central nerve system is the, uh, the brain. And so the 75% of what you can see there is the uh, cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into left and right hemispheres. Um, and then each hemisphere is divided into um, lobes that are named for the bones that, that lie above them. So you have frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Okay, frontal regions are mostly motor. Uh, there's uh, also premotor activities there, uh, like executive functions, working memory, stuff like that. Um, you also have specific areas for like the speech muscles, for the visual eye field, stuff like that. Uh, the parietal lobe contains the somatosensory cortex. These are the skin receptors for like touch and temperature and things like that. Um, that was the homunculus. Remember the homunculus, the little guy there? So there's large regions of that that are devoted to your face and to your hands because you have a lot of sensors there. Your lips have lots of sensory receptors. Uh, the temporal lobe has uh, lots of memory areas. It has some uh, limbic areas. It has areas associated with, um, with sound. Um, and then kind of at these areas in the border here are speech. That's the uh, sensory speech areas. Put it in here. <laughs> OK. Uh, and then occipital lobe is, is visual things. Kind of hidden by this is the diencephalon. That contains the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The pineal gland, we didn't talk about much. You, you can ignore that. The thalamus is an important sensory relay. The hypothalamus is a visceral reflex center, the primary one. These are the core of the limbic system, uh, connects the um, emotions to the thoughts and then to the function of the body. It's part of that diencephalon. Here you can see part of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in posture, fine motor activities, motor learning. Uh, it integrates sensory information uh, from from the muscles to intended uh, movements by the primary motor cortex, so it's important that way. And uh, then the brainstem, you can kind of see some of the brainstem here. This is the medulla, again, important visceral reflex center. 
Above it is the pons, a relay center, has some visceral reflexes in it, and then kind of hidden here is the midbrain, where we have lots of visual and auditory reflexes and, and processing in those areas. It's a lot, but it's, uh, it's what it is. Okay. So there's the limbic system that just kind of shows it with uh, the, 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 the different regions that are wrapped around the diencephalon. Here's the diencephalon. Uh, there's the thalamus. Uh, kind of in there is somewhere is the, um, the hypothalamus. And then these areas here are uh, basal ganglia and parts of the temporal lobe. There's the amygdala. Um, the mammillary body, that's hypothalamus. Also the olfactory bulb and little bits of the prefrontal area. And so the limbic system includes the areas that are, are involved in sensory input. And so it attaches emotion to sensory input. And uh, it also is involved in uh, areas that are gonna form memory and that are related to visceral functions, the hypothalamus. So it, it kind of links all these things together. Okay, the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so these are the nerves that branch off the central nervous system. They include these 31 pair of spinal nerves and then the cranial nerves, which come off the, the um, areas of the brain, a little bit off the cerebrum, but mostly midbrain, medulla, pons. Um, and so they're important. The spinal nerves are all mixed nerves. They contain both sensory and motor branches, um, and they contain both somatic and autonomic. Cranial nerves can be sensory, motor, or mixed. They also can contain autonomic and somatic, but the distinction is, is less clear there because it's, it's a little older system. Um, all nerves themselves are just bundles of axons and dendrites that are surrounded in connective tissues There'll be arteries and veins in there and fat, but it's, it's just, you know, it's axons and dendrites that are going to the different organs, to and from different organs. And, and so it's, um, you know, it's nerve tissue outside the central nervous tissue system. Uh, occasionally there are ganglia, which are a collection of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system. I didn't say much about it here, but it shows up in the autonomic nervous system. So, so it, it's kind of in another system. So the spinal nerves, uh, there's 31 pair, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. All spinal nerves have, uh, specific cutaneous distributions called dermatones. They all have branches going that are somatic, going to the muscles, somatic uh, motor, and they all have autonomic branches that are going to visceral organs. And so you have some of that both. Um, this is just showing the kind of where these things arise. The nerves combine and re, you know, so you may have several, several cervical spinal nerves kind of going to the same place. And these recombinations of peripheral nerves are called a plexus. And so they look like these braided structures. And I think that's what it means. Um, I just wanted you to know what is, what is a spinal nerve? You know, where do they come from? What's within one? Um, sensory motor mixed. Okay. The cranial nerves are, they, they're numbered one through 12, but they also have a name. Uh, they are mostly going to uh, sensory organs on the head, um, motor, skin and, mo and muscles of the head, um, and, and a little bit of, of the neck, but then there's some that go to visceral organs. Uh, good examples of the cranial nerves are the olfactory nerve, which um, receives sensory information from the olfactory epithelium the optic nerve, which receives sensory information from the retina of the eye. Um, then the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens all re send motor information to muscles that are involved in moving the eye or controlling the size of the iris or the, um, the how, how round the lens is. Okay, and so th there's you know, those are five, almost half of the sensor of the um, cranial nerves that are dealing with just uh, really two 
sensory structures of the, of the, the head. The trigeminal nerve is a big mixed nerve, as is the facial nerve. Um, the vestibulocochlear goes to the inner ear. Um, let's see, the facial, the glossopharyngeal, and I think it's the hypoglossal receive information from taste buds. And then the vagus is a, a big cranial nerve that, that carries uh, parasympathetic impulses to organs like the heart, lungs, and digestive system. So some really important stuff there. Um, relatively small, difficult to see, but, um, but important. Um, and and um, so these, these facial and trigeminal nerves, I talked about them with the muscles of facial expression. They're kind of involuntary. Um, even though they're somatic, uh, the limbic system really affects them. And so you, you, you can't hide your feelings. Now. And some of us are really bad at it. I'm bad at it. Um, uh, my wife knows exactly what I'm thinking uh, whenever she looks at me. So, okay, so there's the picture of the nerve. So the, um, the anterior ones are, are, have the low numbers. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, they just, they just start in back there. Um, the uh, olfactory one is the only one coming from the cerebrum. The rest of them are coming from areas farther and farther back. Most are coming back from the midbrain. Uh, the lots come from the medulla um, and, and the pons. Okay, so then we go to the somatic system. The somatic system contains sensory and motor stuff, and it's involved in things you can consciously determine. And so that means it's going to be projected onto the cerebrum because that's where our conscious brain is. So we talked about the senses because these are, you, you can figure out that something's touched you. And, and so we had general senses, which are distributed in the skin, the muscles, uh, and various tendons and things like that. Then you have the special senses, which are, are in the head and contain large sense organs. For the general senses, usually it's individual receptor cells. Okay. For the special senses, you have uh, complex organs. And so like here's the ear, there's an external ear, a middle ear, and then the sensory structures are actually in the inner ear. The cochlea is where we detect sound. The vestibule, the utricle and saccula, is where we can take, detect head position. And then the semicircular canals here, these loops, are we detect head rotation. Okay. Um, in the inner ear, it's all based upon these mechanoreceptors, which are called hair cells. Okay. The hair cells in the cochlea are in fluid and they detect vibrations that have been transferred to the fluid by the tympanic membrane and then the, the ossicles. And so that uh, we have thousands of these hair cells and depending which ones are moved, we deter determine it to be high pitched or low pitched sounds. Okay. We also have hair cells in the uh, vestibule here. These are hair cells right there. And um, they're embedded in jelly with some crystals in which are called the otoliths. And when you turn your head, the weight of the crystals will cause this jelly, cause this jelly to slump, and that bends the hair cells, and that we detect that as changes in the position of the head. This is part of our, our sense of equilibrium. Okay. Then we also have these semicircular canals, these tubes, tubular loops that are filled with fluid. And here the receptor cells are at the base of the canals, and where there's a little expanded area where fluid can kind of flow through this canal, it pushes this thing over. And when it does, the hair cells here, and this is just like a layer of jelly, those hair cells here will say, well, the fluid in there is, is, is rotating, and so the head must be spinning in this direction. Um, and so this is part of your, your sense of equilibrium. You also use visual information, and you also use information on the position of the limbs. And so this is all, um, kind of integrated, lots of it is in the midbrain, nucleus is in the midbrain. Um, and so this stuff comes from the inner ear and it's gonna go into this cochlear nucleus, 
which I think is in the medulla, but then it goes to the colliculi, which are in the midbrain. And, and uh, that's where that goes. For sound information, that's eventually gonna wind up in the temporal cort cortex. Okay. Okay, uh, the eye. Okay, so the eye has three layers. The outer layer is the fibrous tunic. It's made up of the cornea which is in front, it's kind of bowed out in front and it's transparent. The sclera or the white of the eye, that it covers most of the rest of the eye. These form a rigid container and then there's fluid in here that keeps the eye inflated. Then you have the vascular tunic, which includes the choroid, which is this region here, um, contains blood vessels and pigment. The ciliary body, which is muscular. Okay, the lens, Again, transparent and, and bends light, and then the iris in front, okay, which is kind of shown there. That's all vascular tunic. And then the, the nervous tunic is the retina and then the optic nerve. Okay, there's a look through the front of the eye. That's what the, the eye doctor sees when he peers in your eye. He sees this is the optic disc where the optic nerve enters. Also, blood vessels enter. This is your blind spot. Here, this central area is where the majority of your receptor cells are. That's the fovea. Um, this contains the most receptor cells and the most cones. So that's where your color vision is. And uh, let's see, these cones look like um, they're a smaller receptor cell. These are the rods. Rods are less sensitive or more sensitive, but only pick up on light. Uh, they, they can't pick up on color. Um, and rods are linked to neurons, and so three lot rods may be linked to one neuron, but each cone has its own neuron back to the brain. Okay, and so that's kind of how it's hooked up. Um, the, here's, here's the rods and cones here, and the neurons actually sit on top, so light would have to pass this way to get in through there. This is all backwards. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I have to do this. Don't look at this. All right. Okay, so sensory, sensory areas of the cerebral cortex include the parietal, the temporal, the uh, occipital regions, and a little bit of the frontal lobe for uh, olfactory. But there, there is a big part of the frontal lobe that's also somatic but not sensory, and this is the motor region. And so these are these regions up front are motor. Um, and this includes the frontal eye fields, Broca's area to control the speech muscles, the premotor area, which does motor planning, and then the primary motor cortex, uh, this region here in red, that controls individual muscles. Okay, and so that, that makes up at least half of the frontal lobe right there. And then you have these prefrontal areas. This is where we contain lots of executive functions like your personality, your thoughts, your judgment, concentration, impulse control. All that is here and it's surprisingly linked to lots of motor activity. And so being inactive can, can be uh, a problem because it, it impairs your ability to get blood to these regions and, and um, it, it hurts you. And so uh, physical activity is good for these executive functions. Uh, motor control, uh, here's the central region. Um, the motor cortex and the, uh, is, is kind of where things start. And this is in the frontal lobe of the cerebrum. And there's premotor and, and motor areas. But um, this is also receiving uh, information from the cerebellum and basal nuclei, which are getting uh, sensory information from the muscles and from, from other things to let us know about body position. And this is where we stored some of our motor learning. Uh, so like if you know how to ride a bike or play piano um, and can do that well without really thinking too much about it, it's the cerebellum that's used that. And then this stuff is, is um, you know, you're going to get um, uh, interaction between several structures like the basal ganglia, the red nucleus, and things like that, um, as these motor pathways uh, interact with, with ascending pathways that are, are going to allow us to 
uh, coordinate our motor activity. Um, here's the information that was in the book. So you decide up on your, in your frontal lobe of your cerebrum what you're going to do, but uh, there's, there's not just one pathway, there are direct and indirect pathways. And the indirect pathways are really key because uh, they allow you to coordinate between these uh, things that are stored in the cerebellum um, and also in parts of your basal nuclei, which includes this corpus striatum, substantia nigra, and the red nucleus. And then you're gonna send information down that will eventually reach the skeletal muscles. Okay. In fact, we talked about Parkinson's disease, and in Parkinson's disease, it's this small little substantia nigra that's damaged, and that leads to loss of voluntary motion. Okay, so I don't know that I have to do that. Um, and this can, you can also lose voluntary motion through uh, demyelinating diseases like AMS, um, uh, lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis also leads to loss of that type of stuff. Okay, uh, other motor activities are even more complex, like the motor activities that control speech. That involves communication from things like Wernicke's area, Broca's area, uh, visual areas, and, and memory areas. So, so it gets even more complex when we're talking about something like speech. All right, so let me stop that. Does anybody have any questions? You can chat them if you'd like, or you can just ask. Maybe. Did some of that seem familiar? Yes, yes, okay, vaguely. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's, uh, if nothing else, let's go look at the, uh, the essay questions. Okay, so here, um, I w I'm going to give you just two essay questions, and it will randomly assign you one of these two questions. One, is the, one of these is on the neurotransmitters. What is a neurotransmitter and how does it work? How does a neurotransmitter produce an effect in a postsynaptic cell? Why are neurotransmitters important? Support your answer using specific examples. So I'm asking you to say, you know, okay, neurons release neurotransmitters to signal other cells. Okay, that's the basic idea. So it's a chemical messenger and it's got to bind to a receptor. So the other cell has to have a receptor to it and it's released over this little short gap. And so it's very specific and it affects the other cell by, by doing something that their receptor is linked to. Usually the receptor is a ligand gated ion channel. Well, so it, it's gonna open an ion channel. If that's a sodium channel, that will cause the, uh, the second cell to depolarize and so it will excite that cell. Um, and if it's, if it's, well, like say it's a, a potassium channel, it'll open a potassium and allow potassium to, ch to diffuse out of the cell and the cell becomes more negative and then it might inhibit the, the second cell. Um, so you can give an answer like that. You could talk about some uh, neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. Acetylcholine uh, opens sodium channels on skeletal muscles. Uh, so it's, it causes them to be excited. Um, but you can have different receptors and they can be linked to different ion channels. So you have, can have some that are in, uh, inhibitory. So sometimes acetylcholine can inhibit other activities in the central nervous system or maybe in visceral organs. Okay, then the second question that says, describe the somatic nervous system and the control of voluntary movements. What areas of the brain are involved? Describe the types of pathways that lead to skeletal muscle. Okay, so the somatic nervous system, that's, um, that's a functional definition of, the, of a nervous system and it it's, uh, involves being able to consciously perceive or control something. 
Okay, so that means it must involve the cerebrum because that's where our conscious thought is. Okay, and so um, somatic things might be the conscious perception of senses or the conscious control of skeletal muscles. And in the case of skeletal muscles, this area occurs in the frontal, frontal lobe of the cerebrum, okay? There are premotor areas and motor areas. The primary motor cortex are probably the two that you should mention. Okay. And these things decide what to do, and they initiate actions that are gonna then go to other brain areas. Uh, sometimes they can control muscles directly, but more likely it's indirectly with the help of the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, the corpus striatum and the red nucleus. Those are the indirect pathways, okay? And so that allows the brain to coordinate previously learned motor activities and input on the position of the limbs and tension on the muscles that's going to the cerebellum, okay? And so again, when you're learning a new motor activity, it's probably all learned consciously for the first time. So like think of, you know, learning to drive a car the first time, you know, you, you're kind of really aware of where your hands are. You have to be aware of what your feet are doing. And so it's, it's, it's very demanding of your attention. Okay. But then two years later, you know, you can talk on the phone, eat and put on makeup all the while you drive a car. You know, and, and so, and that's because your cerebellum is doing most of those things. Okay. And those would, of course, those are going to be the indirect pathways. Okay, so let me stop that. Did that seem to be reasonable? Like, like you could answer that question maybe. Yes, okay, Ariel said yes. Okay. Okay, there won't be anything on the muscles that we learned for lab. Okay, that's stuff we just did on the quiz. So don't worry about that. Um, so I'm not going to ask you about any specific muscles uh, or what they do or what they're attached to. That's, that's out. Uh, I won't ask you about muscle cells. That was stuff for the previous lecture exam. Uh, I'll ask you about um, neurons. Okay, there'll be, uh, that's a big topic. Divisions of the system. Uh, general functions of the of the nervous system. Um, I'll ask you about uh, the brain and spinal cord, and then I'll ask you about senses and the brain areas that control them and motor movement. That's the big thing. Okay, <laughs> I couldn't find any video anywhere. Okay. So I'm recording this and I'm hoping to just put this on the site. So I have the, the, um, the PowerPoint with the review slides is on there. The, um, the essay questions are on there. There's also a practice test on there that has sample questions. I'll put a key on there tomorrow. I'm recording this and I'll try and put this up on the uh, website today. We'll see. Uh, how that goes. I tried it with the other class and I had some tr some problems. So, okay. All right. I only got a couple minutes here. Does anybody else have a question? You can text or you could even unmute your microphone and ask. Okay. Diego, any questions? You're usually willing. Stacy, no, okay, all right, okay, anyone else here? Uh, there was a, um, there was a video on the last lab quiz we had, I, I think it was called like Muscles. Oh. Yeah, uh, it was a question about this video called Muscles and I couldn't find the video anywhere posted in like Moodle or anything, so I was wondering oh, if I could Oh, so that's the, um, that's the, uh, there's, that's one of the yellow boxes. That's a, a video that we're linked to 
from the uh, Films on Demand site of the library. So you have to type in your, your, um, your Highland ID and password, and then it'll, it'll give you access to the video. It's about 20 minutes. Um, the, that won't be on the, ex, on the exam. Um, there's one on, uh, let's see, there's one on the brain, but um, that, that won't be an exam. That was on muscles. Um, but you should be able to get to it even if you're off campus. Um, however, that um, if your internet access isn't so good, that could be an issue there. But, but you should, that yellow box, kind of scroll through that. There's a place where you can put your Highland ID and password. Okay, any other questions? Okay, For lab three, um, yeah. are you gonna post that um, Wednesday? Probably, or whenever we get probably Thursday. <laughs> okay. Because I knew we, did, we just did lab two, so I wasn't sure when you were gonna right. post lab three. Yeah, I, um, I had, a, I had um, uh, a state meeting last week, and so that I had, it had a lot of work to get ready for that. So I thought, oh, and we got an exam coming. I'll just wait till that's done. Okay. Okay. And, I, and I'm thinking that we probably won't have a lab exam. I don't, you know, it, um, you guys are just working with paper there. If, if we were going to do this online and I knew the whole semester, I'd be sending you a lab kit. Um, because there's there's a limit to what you can do with a screen and just paper, and so we'll we'll probably just go with without having a la a second lab exam. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I know it probably hurts, but <laughs> yeah, I'm getting thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Um, okay, so uh, if. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, all right okay so if you have a question I will I will try and be better about checking emails I'm I'm way behind on grading I, I apologize <laughs> okay um, all right so so text me I will spend a lot of time on emails this afternoon and tomorrow and so I will try and be available that way all right so I'm gonna end the meeting uh, watch, I will try and put this recording online if you want to view it again. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good luck, and I'll uh, see you later.